are so honored on the We Are For Good podcast to uh, welcome our first philanthropist, Rock Mc Ross McKnight, to the show. Um, Ross, hello. Thank you. Thanks for coming <laughs> into our kitchen Thanks table. Thanks for saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for <laughs> taking, a yeah, taking a chance on our little fledgling podcast and coming to talk to us. Uh, you're, you're, you're coming to us from Dallas, but Throckmorton, Texas. I never want to stop and talk to you without giving Throckmorton, Texas a shout out. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if you could just uh, introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your story, because I don't want to steal it from you. Well, uh, I am a, a, a rancher uh, from Throckmorton, Texas. I've lived there all my life. I, uh, my, uh, my father died when I was 15, and uh, my mother left town. And I'm one of those people that you can say was truly raised by a village, the community of Throckmorton raised me and, and uh, lived by myself until I graduated from high school. I went to Oklahoma State University. I didn't own a pair of shoes. I had several, I wasn't barefoot, I had several pairs of boots. And I went up there and, and got the opportunity of a lifetime to grow and, and to become my own person. I didn't go to Texas Tech because it was like going to high school. I didn't go to A&M because they they, uh, they didn't have girls at that time. <laughs> and so, I, uh, so I went to OSU. I wanted to go to ag school. I've always wanted to be a rancher. I inherited 500 acres of land. And uh, uh, when I was 15, it was worth about, uh, oh, about $80 an acre. And, and so between that and the money I could earn, uh, you know, we, we went to school and and uh, got real lucky going to OSU. I'm not saying that I might not have uh, felt the same about Tech or Texas A&M or the University of Texas or even maybe Oklahoma University, although I doubt that. But if, if I'd have gone there, but uh, OSU felt like home to me, and I was looking for a home. And I was looking for a set of friends that what I did – was important to them. My uh, th that I made class, that I did well in school, that I was somewhat successful, and and so um, I've always thought that that uh, uh, that that start at OSU gave me uh, a real leg up. Um, I, I graduated with thirteen in my senior class, wow. and and I wasn't top of my class. I'll tell you that, and. Three years later, uh, or two years later, I was in the White House with the President of the United States. I was one of five student body presidents that was selected to to talk to President Richard Nixon about the troubles uh, in the Vietnam War, about the things that were affecting all students. I met there on four different occasions with the student body presidents from Berkeley, student body president from NYU, uh, one from the University of Wisconsin, and, and then one from a, a a small school in uh, in New Hampshire, and we were to bring uh, what was con what the concerns of today's youth were, and and uh, so it was. I mean, think about that when you had thirteen in your senior class and you had that opportunity. I that's extraordinary. Wow, what do you say? <laughs> you know. And and you say you had multiple conversations, like multiple trips in there, because you were also. I mean, you're being humble, but student body president. You were also FFA national president too, right? Did no, 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 I was not. My son was. Okay, I'm remember. making that up. I think I thought you that's were right. in FFA as well, though. I, I, I was in FFA. Mm -hmm. I just said it wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, this is the, one of the things I love about you because you are so self-deprecating and it's like <laughs> the things that we celebrate about, I mean, we, we haven't even given a bio on Ross and I mean, that's really not what this podcast is about. But, you know, it's it's not about Ross's success or his wealth. It's really about his his altruism. And, I mean, Ross is a successful banker. He's a rancher. He's an oil man. But to me, he's a philanthropist, and he's a seer of people. And he finds a way to connect people and connect missions. And I'm so curious about – you have made several – seven eight figure gifts in your lifetime that I as i watch it from the from the landscapes you know on the outskirts i mean these are transformational gifts and the way you have made these gifts is so smart 
and savvy. And I really want to dive into that. But, you know, first, I just I just want to know where this giving spirit started for you and, and how you became um, such an altruistic human being. No, I, I don't know that I am an altruistic human being, if I could even pronounce it right. <laughs> I, uh, but, but, but I, you know, I'm just a... I'm just a, a rancher farmer from West Texas, and, and we've been lucky to do things. And I've always felt like you owe back to the institutions uh, that have helped you achieve that success or have allowed you to to build on that success. And, and those institutions in, in my position have always been the, the town of Throckmorton that I just got through saying it raised me. Uh, it, it was uh, Oklahoma State University. And it was uh, uh, the health system, which was Scott and White, that allowed me to to have good health and and to send the people that are close to me, friends to me, or friends of friends, or friends of employees, uh, to and get the best health care. I've always thought that health care was the most important thing that we could do, and and I don't I think it's a right. I think it's an, an inalienable right that we should all have to have good health. And have the best that we can, and and so uh, uh, I've always supported those institutions, and that's how I made those choices. I've I've made some mistakes in my mind, and and uh, in in some of my philanthropy, and and but I've learned from it. And you learn after you do some of these things that philanthropy is a is an investment. It's an investment in people. It shouldn't be an investment in institutions. In my mind, it shouldn't be an investment in in bricks and mortar it should be an investment in people and you should try to make their other people's lives better because of that investment and i think that's how you have so when, whenever we were lucky enough to, to be somewhat successful then we were able to to make investments in people's lives and to make their lives better through education through health care through some type of philanthropy that affects people I love your heart, Ross. And um, I was saying right before the podcast, you know, I got to cut my teeth at OSU, basically went to school there, got to have my first um, impasse with working on the development side of things at the OSU Foundation. And one of my life mentors is Kirk Jewell, who's been the president and CEO. And I think, you know, y'all have had a really special relationship over the years, too, as you've, you know, made such transformational philanthropy come to life at Oklahoma State. Um, I wonder, you know, Kirk tipped us to this and said, you know, when you talk to Ross, you have to hear the story of the Baylor Scott and White gift. And I wonder if that's something you would share with us. I know it brought me to tears. <laughs> so I, I heard it. I heard it. Yeah, it. secondhand. And, and John and I were both weeping and we just thought this was this was a story that people need to hear and need to yeah. know because it's a story, not a big philanthropy. It's actually a story about how one person who doing the right thing and standing quietly in the background has the ability to make just an unbelievable impact in someone's life. Well, um, when I, I've been, there, there are things about philanthropy that have always been appealing to me and things that have not been appealing. And I saw, we'll have an opportunity to, to address some of them that are not appealing. But one of the things that is really appealing and, and maybe the most so is to, is to match the passion of the donor with the need of an institution. Mm -hmm. And so I was head of the uh, development committee and then I formed a separate standalone foundation at Scott and White and I was the first chair of it. And they always wanted me to give to something and they're always, as development officers always are, they uh, always pass something by you over and over again. And, and I just told them I'm not interested in that but when I see something I'm interested in, I'll tell you. And I, Billy and I were in New York uh, in, a, in a taxi ride from the airport, and we got a phone call from someone at Scott and White that said a lady named Glenda Tanner Vosicek had been diagnosed with can cancer. And, and uh, Glenda was uh, a dear friend and was head of the executive health program there. And so it came to be that we were in need to build a, a cancer treatment center. And and uh, so 
Billy and I talked about it, and and I uh, I called back down and and uh, and I asked her to to speak to to Glenda, and she said, uh, I said Glenda, I'd like to come by and talk to you about something, and she said, No, Ross, I'll never let you see me like this. I don't want you to uh, to remember me like this. Now Glenda was the secretary to executive health, and executive health is where we where I was able to refer patients to to get them the same care that Billy and, and my kids received and, and that I received from the same doctors. And so she was the one that I always said that Glenda didn't didn't know uh, how to walk on water at Scott and White, but she sure knew where the rocks were. <laughs> and so she could keep you getting what you wanted and, and do, do it quickly. And Glenda said, Ross, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you come see me. She said, I'm not going to treat me, and, and I, I look too bad. And I said, well, Glenda, would you let me name the cancer center after you? Mm-hmm. And she said, Ross said, I, I don't deserve that. She said, well, you need to name the cancer center after yourself. You're successful. And I said, Glenda, success is not what you do for yourself. Significance is what is important, and it's what you do for others. And you've helped others get the health care that you need, and that you've always, you've always supported it. Whether it was a day working cowboy that I sent down there, or whether it was, you know, someone a wealthy banker, it didn't make any difference. You got them that health care. So, so fast forward, I signed. Bill and I made the naming guild. We went out try, trying to what, raise uh, $6.8 million, and we raised nearly $13 million. Wow. We, uh, uh, I signed over 2,000 letters. I got Drayton McLean, who was chairman of the board at that time, and Scott and White, to sign the same 2,000 letters. We had 1,600 people out of the 2,000 letters that gave, not because we sent the letter, but because of what Brenda had done to them. So we ended up, we, we bought it. We, we, we did, of course, Glenda had tied it within two months. She knew it was coming, but she didn't. And it, a couple of years later, we we cut the ribbon and we all did, did it. And, and it was it was really unbelievable. And I went in and, and uh, most people had not a clue who Glenda Tanner Bosacek was. They still don't. And I went into the Glenda Tanner Bosacek Cancer Center and the waiting room, unbeknownst to us, was named the McKnight Family Waiting Room. Mm-hmm. And on the wall of it was a picture of my family. I didn't know that was coming. I didn't know that was going to be there. I had no idea that wasn't part of the deal. Okay, It wasn't important. It was a little embarrassing. That wasn't what we were after. We weren't after thanks or rewards or anything like that and but it was very rewarding but it was not nearly as rewarding as I went to a meeting the next morning of of Scott and White trustees and uh, meetings usually start when you have them with doctors they usually start pretty early and this meeting started at uh, it started at seven o'clock and so I went to the cancer treatment center at 6 30 just to walk around before the meeting. And they didn't know who I was. And uh, I walked around and and the nurses got to telling me how important this gift was and how it allowed people of all walks of life to get humanitarian treatment while they were suffering from the worst disease on earth, that they could be treated in the privacy and if they got sick, they were publicly humiliated by that. If they if they cried, if they were with a loved one, if they were by themselves, what they got out of this and how important it was to these people. They had not a clue who I was. I cried for 10 minutes. Because, because that's something. That's something that you were able to do with philanthropy is to give people dignity back give them proper treatment, to give them hope for tomorrow with dignity. That's my mayor's gun voice. 
Okay. Okay. We're like 13 minutes in. I've already cried once. I mean, people, when we talk about one good thing on this show, I mean, Ross has just shared a story, and and, and I don't want to I don't want to put these words in your mouth, Ross. You know, of a moment that was probably one of the most precious moments in your life, walking through there, and it wasn't a development officer that did that for him. That wasn't a gift. You know, that could have been, you know, what some people Tight. call dust yeah. catchers. <laughs> you know, to put on his bookshelf somewhere. It was a woman who saw Ross probably very early on before Ross was the Ross that everyone sees now, and a woman who treated Ross the same way that she treats everybody who walks into that hospital. And the fact that you were able to see that in her and then pay it forward to everyone is exactly why we are all in this business. It is so extraordinary. That that was a better story than the version that I even heard, which was so <laughs> sensational. <laughs> it's the details, I think, that matter in this business and the hope and the human connection, and that was it in spades. I love it. So I want to talk a little bit about um, this gift that you gave to Oklahoma State University, and you've given many, many gifts to, to Oklahoma State, but I think the the McKnight Performing Arts Center was such n a huge gift, not because the uh, the amount, it was a massive gift and, and a mas massive amount, but to give an arts gift at an ag and engineering institution that had for so long, you know, not had something to stand up on with the arts, and you have plopped down one of the finest performing arts center in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, where the New York <laughs> City Philharmonic <laughs> flies in on the inaugural opening, the entire symphony, and opens. I want you to talk a little bit about why you made that $25 million gift to OSU and why you made it a program gift, which I thought was so smart, by the way, and how that encouraged people to come along. And I want you to talk about how you and Billy decided to um, arrive at that place, because you've done a lot of other things with scholarships and athletics and ag, um, but this one really, really struck me. Well, thank you. Billy has always been a great supporter of the arts. Mm -hmm. And me, I can't read music. <laughs> and and uh, I, do, I do get chills when the New York Philharmonic strikes up the national anthem. But I, Billy has been a lover of the arts, and she's always pushed us to express uh, our philanthropy in the arts. Thank you, we've Billy. Su <laughs> we've supported the band program in Throckmorton. There wouldn't be a band program. We've paid the band director for more years than I can imagine. Okay, and you know we're a high school with sixty kids in that has a marching band that was fifth in the state of Texas. Up to 300 kids <laughs> last year. That is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> that's a whole other. And that says something about, because bands are serious in Texas. Yeah. If, you, if you don't know about like Texas Lights. football and Texas <laughs> bands, it is a thing. And Everything's so bigger it, in Texas. But, but Billy was a member of the school board, and so she used that position to make sure that we had a good arts program and a good arts program in, in Throckmorton. The best we could do was, was a, a wonderful band director. So in about the late 90s, uh, we started that. And so we went on from that and, and learned about the arts. And, and I learned about the arts. I've always enjoyed them. I've always enjoyed Broadway and those kind of things. Uh, so Burns Hargis, our president, of course, got the idea that, that he wanted to build a uh, performing arts center. So he came down to me and, and asked me for a gift in the same amount that we ended up giving to uh, endow, I mean, to to build the, be the lead gift to build the Performing Arts Center, and I just told him I wasn't interested. And he said, why not? And I said, I'm not interested in brick and mortar. This is not about Billy and me. It, it is a, it's really, it's it's about something that we can do and we're not interested. And he's, I never will forget, he, he was a little miffed at me you know, for, for not being more responsive to his gift. And and uh, so I, I said, kind of like I said down at Scott and White, I'll know it when I see it, okay? 
So Billy and I had this home, had this home in Beaver Creek, and we were invited by another OSU person and a, a wonderful, she was one of the last person of the year this year at OSU, Helen Hodges, and we were invited by Helen to go to a, uh, a performance at, at Bravo Vale, uh, the opening night performance of the New York Philharmonic at Bravo Vale, and I had never heard the New York Philharmonic, and we went to it, and I got chills in my spine, and I, I said, at, at my age, there's not much to send chills up my spine anymore. And and so I want to be able to do that in the future and enjoy that in the future as we go. And what do we have to do? Well, we ended up getting tickets to the Philharmonic the next night. And we ended up finding out what it costs to have the Philharmonic come. And we ended up thinking, this is something that we can do. This is something that is important to us, and this is something that can change lives. The, the building doesn't change any lives, any building that you build, but what goes on inside that building is what changes lives. And, and the interaction, the relationships, the, the teaching opportunities, even more the learning opportunities that go on inside that building are, are what and the experiences the mu the musical experiences that people have and and so uh, we talk to people like, and, and uh, encourage them to encourage Burns because Burns as a, as a pragmatic accountant is what he he was before he was an attorney before he was the university president he he really wanted the money for the for the uh, uh, for the building and so as we as thing, as things went on, we actually had Burns go and meet with a lady named Anne, Anne Marie, and, and uh, Anne Marie McDermott, who is our classical musical director of the Magnet Center now, and went to New York and met with Anne Marie. She's a classical pianist, and very, very few in the world are even close to Anne Marie. And uh, she told him the importance of the performances. So we ended up making a gift, and uh, uh, we asked the university to, to match that gift through fundraising, and we made it for the endowment, the endowment, for an endowment of the performances. And what that means is that the money that, let's just say there's a 5% spend policy, and Billy and I gave $25 million. It's fairly public, and so I don't mind saying what it is, and the university foundation raised another $25 million. and so we had a $50 million endowment. And so before we sold, before we sold a ticket, before we raised a sponsorship, we were able to spend uh, $2.5 million a year to cover expenses and to bring people in that, that were, nobody could imagine coming to Oklahoma, much less Stillwater. And, and I think it is really proven to be successful. We, we believe, and Billy really stresses this, that education is to be well-rounded, that it's not just to, to, to be sure you need to, to enjoy athletics, sure you need to have great classrooms, sure you need to, to learn for the future, sure you need to build relationships, but you need to grow in the opportunities that if you were in Throckmorton, Texas, or Davis, Oklahoma, you never had that opportunity to grow. And we've given people that opportunity to at OSU through the Magnet Center. And that's why we chose to do it through the through an endowment. And and of course Burns has been a wonderful partner and raised the money for the building through through the university. And uh, the first year was a resounding success. Of course obviously uh, uh, COVID nineteen has had a lot to do with with right now. In fact, we were supposed to, this last weekend was supposed to have been the opening of the second year of it with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And, and uh, of course, all that had to be canceled like everything else. But again, this gives OSU a seat at the table mm -hmm. of the arts. And when they're talking about uh, major programs, I'm on the board uh, for, for some reason of the New York Philharmonic. And the New York Philharmonic has about 160 or 70, maybe $80 million in its endowment. And it's the oldest orchestra in the United States. We have $50 million in our endowment of, wow. of the McKnight Center. And, and we're less than a year old. Okay, We opened last October 11th. 
And so we're very proud of those things. Uh, but it's an investment in the future. How many, how many young people, how many students, how many families, how many professors, how many, how much recruiting can we do of other professors, you know, to, to bring in that want their family to be exposed to what, to the opportunities that we have at OSU. And, and they're not opportunities that they, they think of coming from a cow company. <laughs> well, as a daughter of a music teacher, I want to thank yeah. you for that because I grew up going to theater and going to the symphony, and I just think you know it's so such a gift to Oklahomans to be able to have access to that. For me to be able to take my children up there, we were going to go to see Stomp, um, which was on the lineup for this year. But I, I think what I like the most about that story, Ross, is that by making that gift, you made it not about you. Not only did you expand your impact, but you allowed $25 million worth of other donors to come alongside you and build this with you. And, and, and that is what you just said in the beginning, which is I, I feel like is kind of the underpinning of the raw story is community is everything. And when we can all come together and put our little part in, we can build something quite extraordinary that can shift the landscape of how people see us, of how we embrace our education, how we embrace the arts, how we diversify what we know in this world and what we see and, em and embrace. And just by virtue of you having a f sophisticated level of thinking with your philanthropy, it allowed others to be a part of that gift too. And that's what I think is so special about that gift. I love well, it. And go ahead, go ahead, John. I was just gonna say as an arts major from OSU, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because it is definitely an underfunded sector of the school, but what a transformational gift. I just, I hear your story, Ross, and I hear that, you know, you're, in, you have the banker side of you. So I wonder that you're always looking at things from an investment point of view, but philanthropy plus investment is a progressive way to think about it. And I wonder if you could talk about how maybe over the years, how you have transitioned your giving to be more in, Sure. Maybe you've always done this, but it's really intentional about making investments. We talk about playing the long game, and I see Ross has been playing the long game for a very long, long time. Long time. <laughs> He's the inventor of the long game, exactly. probably. Exactly, so I love this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the first things that, that you have to do, in my mind, that you have to do to be a successful philanthropist, it's not just making gifts, okay? And it's not just giving. Every development officer's got an idea of what they'd like to give the money to. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, but, but it, the thing is, is we should, we as philanthropists should have an idea of where we want to invest it. We should have an idea of what our end result we want out of that donation, whether it's a, a $10 donation or a, a $10 million donation. We should have a goal in mind of what we're trying to do. And, and I think I said earlier, uh, I uh, have made some gifts that weren't particularly wise, okay? And those were mainly gifts, and they were big gifts. So, I mean, comes to mind the seven-figure gifts, a, a couple of them, that were not, that, that they contributed to a campaign, but the campaign didn't make any difference, and that gift in the campaign didn't make any difference. It made the the athletic director perhaps happy or it make the development officer happy, but it did not contribute really anything meaningful. It didn't create anything. So when I think about a gift, I want it to be something that, that can be transformational to uh, something that we want to transform, whether it's scholarships at OSU coming from, from rural communities uh, outside of the state, whether it's um, uh, you know, to, to endow the arts at OSU, whether it's to uh, build and endow the uh, the cancer treatment center at, at Mayor Scott White in Temple. Any of these things have that. Now, for me to give a, a, a million dollars towards building XYZ building, it just doesn't have a trans transformation. And it doesn't really affect people. It makes less money that you do, but it's really a gift. If you give it to us, you, it's nothing more than a gift to the state of Oklahoma. And I want to give to the people that are going to attend Oklahoma State University or that are going to get treatment at Baylor Scott White or that are, are going to in some way, and then they'll learn to pass it on. I don't know who the next person will be that will take from our model 
and, and, and do something in the future. But let me tell you, there'll be somebody, and I hope there are multiple somebodies, and that will, that will say, well, you know, that was a good idea. But if you look at it uh, as a, if, you, if you know what you're trying to do, and that is to build something for someone to make someone better, then you can build a gift that will do that in a particular way. And, and I, think that, I think it can be done in nearly any, uh, in, in nearly any entity that you want to give it to, but you just have to be thoughtful uh, before you make that gift. That's such a good advice too. And I, I just think you, you have, you've probably seen the good and the bad and the ugly on your side. And, and I really want to explore some of that a little bit because I do think it helps us grow. And I, I really kind of want to peek behind the curtain, you know, and look at the wizard <laughs> and see, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is one of the biggest missteps or pet peeves that development professionals make when they're courting major gift donors? Um, they, and they, any specific they, examples would be great. They talk too much and listen too little. Wow. Okay. wow. <laughs> okay. they, they need to try to match the passion of the donor. And if they don't know that donor, they can't match that passion. Most of them don't care. A guy was trying to raise money when I didn't have any back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And he was trying to raise money for <clears throat> a, uh, uh, a youth center in Throckmorton. And he came to me wanting $5,000. And uh, it would have been a pretty good sized gift for Billy and me at that time. And he came to us and he, and he said this. And I said, well, here's what I think we should use that for. And he said, oh, no, you don't understand. I don't want your ideas. I just want your money. Oh, my gosh. Okay. New professionals, I, don't I, ever I, do that. I know it's intuitive, <laughs> but don't ever do that. <laughs> and, and, and so and when you think about it, that was the best lesson that I ended up uh, ended up eight years later and sat there unfinished, and I finished it myself anonymously eight years later. Okay, at a at a cost well over five thousand dollars, I might add. But <laughs> the bottom line was, I, I learned a great lesson. It doesn't make any difference, you know, what whoever's trying to raise that money wants. It's what do you want to do with your money? It's your money, and and so to match that, you've got to do that. So that's the first thing is is listen, don't talk. Uh, I think that, that one of the things that, that we've done, if we've got to be great stewards of the money, and I just, uh, that, of the gift money. And I think that I just told them the, uh, the Scott and White, Linda Voschek, Tanner, Linda Tanner Voschek, Cancer Center story. And we didn't know that they were going to recognize us with a, uh, a family center. And we didn't know they were going to have our family's picture on the wall. We, we had no idea. And yet, when they did, that was very meaningful. That was good stewardship, okay? Uh, and, and so proper recognition, not overbearing, but proper recognition is important. Uh, and proper stewardship of that. But the main thing in that stewardship, I would say, and, and we're having discussions right now with, with how we're raising money to, to support the OSU Foundation and to support the philanthropy and the development officers at the OSU and, and we've got to make sure that what we, that we want to always make sure that we incentivize the behavior that we want on the part of our development officers. Otherwise, we're simply incentivizing the behavior that they're doing. And so a, a great example of that is that they've had a fee, and, and I was part of building the fee in uh, because we had to be transparent in, in what we did and we had a fee and the, and the fee was roughly two percent of what your endowment was and and boy that has become a problem and so on the magnet scholars program uh, we were spending about uh, a third of our <clears throat> earnings from our endowment just to pay the fees and once we realized that we started working with Blair now and we were working with Kirk when we realized it too he, he just retired before we could come to a, a resolution on it but so we were incentivizing people to give estate gifts, okay, by taxing people at on a fee basis 
based on the cash gifts they'd given. So the people like Don Humphreys and Carol and Carl Toma, okay, uh, didn't uh, uh, had to pay that fee to support estate gifts that came up in the future that may or may not be honored. And and we we just have to be better at this. And as donors, we have to demand that that the uh, philanthropies that we give to are better stewards than they are. What a calling to level up, you know, our game. <laughs> and and it's yeah. so helpful because, I mean, when I think of the Carl Thomas and I think of the Ross McKnight's, I mean, these are financial giants, you know, of the business world right now and really tap in. I mean, I'd be asking, we got to tap into that brain power and figure out how to use it to perpetuate our philanthropic footprint, you know, to even greater lengths so we can help more people and expose more people to all of these things that they can offer here. And it, it takes any business decision takes accountability. Okay, we, we we say that, but but any decision that we do in business, we have to hold the people that are responsible for spending that accountable with the way they spend it. And so this is all this is. And in my mind, uh, these monies that are raised to pay for the, the the philanthropy efforts that we have, the development efforts, whether it's at OSU or at Baker Scott White or whatever it is, uh, those monies uh, should come from the beneficiaries because they're the one that recognize, you know, the benefits of it. And so they should pay that instead of having the donor pay it because we don't know the beneficiaries of it. And, you know, they, they you could put a, you could put a lot of uh, rouge on that hog. <laughs> for the for the donor when he Lipstick comes in, but it, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but we but we may not be able to, uh, but we may not be doing what we want to do. And those deans, they can tell you if they're getting what they want. If the dean of agriculture wants a fifty year, a fifty million dollar gift that may not totally pay out for forty years, then he should that should be up to him. But the person that made the the major gift of cash shouldn't be paying for it with fees on his gift. That's it's smart. Just common sense. You yeah, know, you it just it sounds out, so just smart when you say that out loud. Mm -hmm. It seems like something that's so basic. So it, it, it's something different than what we've done. Mm -hmm. And at, at OSU, it's something different than what we've done. At, at, now, that is done at, at Baylor Scott and White. We have three different foundations. And it all, it all funnels into uh, the, the Temple Foundation, uh, funnels into Temple, the old Scott and White. The Bader Foundation funnels into Dallas, the old Bader. But, and so all donations are local in that way, but they also all come under the umbrella of where the benefit goes to, and that's to the institution. And so the institution makes those decisions. Or the, is it being spent well? Okay, and so then the institution is responsible to the donor. And, and, uh, th and that, that's to me what it needs to be. And the foundation employees, the development officers, need to be responsible to the deans or the institution to do their job. Bravo. So, Ross, is there a philanthropist that has inspired you personally? A person that you could say that's kind of um, pushed you? I, I would I would say a couple. And and uh, I would say a couple that, that, that have. The, the finest rich man that I know is a gentleman named Greg McLean. And you've heard of McLean Stadium, and you've heard of, of – uh, but what you haven't heard is all the, all the fire halls that he's built in all the little towns across central and, and Texas, mm -hmm. all the things that – he didn't want his name on McLean Stadium, but they told him if he didn't put, put it on there, that he would, uh, uh, that they were going to sell it again to somebody else for a lot less money. <laughs> I don't know about that as a tactic. <laughs> well, yeah. but, uh, he'd already given the money, and so he just didn't want to stay on. Making you know? a list but, of what not to do as a development yeah. officer, right? <laughs> so I, I, I really respect him for the way he does things. He's very laid back. He's very – and then I respect uh, somebody kind of on the – that's always wanted his, his uh, name out front, and and that provides benefits too. And that's Boone Pickens. Uh, Boone has 
taught one thing to, to me, and that one thing is that we can. Okay, whenever Boone made his first gift, uh, you know, uh, he and I were walking into the, uh, uh, right after he made the first $20 million gift to the stadium, he and I were walking into the first football game of the year, which at that time was in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we walked into a room of, uh, we'd flown up there together and walked in together. Uh, and people were just standing and applauding and, and going bananas for far but And we walked in and he looked at me and he said, well, what is this? He said, is it because of the $20 million? And I said, no, it's because you've shown them that somebody from OSU can do that. They've always doubted that. And I think that all the success that we've had in philanthropy in the last 20 years can be traced nearly completely back to the I can attitude that that first gift of $20 million that Boone made. And we just looked at each other and said, well, he's from Holdenville, Oklahoma. You know, if, if he can do this, then we can do this. And so uh, I, I think that those two people for completely different reasons, great and for his humility, and, and lack of wanting to be out in front, and, and boom for his brashness and willingness to be out in front and show you what it is. So the two completely different people at opposite ends of the spectrum, but both of them are very influential in, in my philanthropic and Billy's philanthropic giving. I love the juxtaposition of yeah. both of those because they're polarizing, but even that polarizing nature is really so helpful. And for anyone that's been living under a rock, I mean, Boone Pickens, you know, made just some of the most extraordinary philanthropic gifts ever to Oklahoma State University. And my favorite story of him is when he was making, I think it was his second hundred million dollar gift um, for endowed scholarships for the branding success, which was a billion dollar campaign that Ross and Billy Chaired. Uh, chaired, which is the largest and most successful fundraising campaign in the state of Oklahoma ever. It ended at a $1.2 billion campaign. When he wa when we were launching that event, he got up to speak at the event and completely forgot that he was going to announce $100 million. <laughs> and his publicist is standing next to us sa saying, Jay. yeah, right. J, J. Ross are such a good guy. And he literally wrote on a piece of paper, announced the $100 million <laughs> gift and walked up and slapped it on the podium in the middle of his speech. And the announcement came in a three-story building, so everyone on the second and third story could see that Sharpie writing. <laughs> and the reaction from the second and third story was, oh my gosh, there's going to be a $100 million gift yeah. announced today. And Boone was just in his boon world, he day. was just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was just so focused so on cool. the mission and the passion. It was like that was sort of ancillary. So um, there's a sidebar kind of to Ross's story that's just so fantastic. I, I want to know, Ross, um, you've, been, you've chaired a lot of things. We mentioned the Branding Success Campaign. You've mentioned Scott and White. You and Billy get, get asked a lot to chair things. I wonder how you two filter kind of how far you want to step into those volunteer roles? When does it seem like it's um, something that would be worth your time? And how do you like to be asked for that? And so any insight on that for our visitors and listeners who are listening who might serve on boards? No, I, I, I think to say yes and do a good job, you have to be willing to say no. And and so you've got to pick, pick your fights because you can't be good at all of them. And so the ones that we have, always the fights that we've always been willing to join in the crusades or the, or the drives that we've always have been around our passions and and so people ask us to, to do that and the thing is do we have a passion for it i mean you can ask me to cheer a campaign for ou football and i wouldn't be very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> julie's <laughs> dying inside the ultimate example <laughs> But, but I mean, and it's not because they don't have a great program. It's because it's not my passion, okay? And, and so what I've got to do is, is say yes to the things that I'm first passionate about and, and realize that I can do a good job of that. I wouldn't be a good United Way chairman because not that they don't do lots of good, but because it's not a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's the most important thing that, that you can do. 
Um, but you also need to limit what you say yes on, because otherwise you can just have so many meetings that, that are just, they turn into meaningless meetings. And, and, uh, and you, you still, have to and have you still want your friends to answer your phone calls. They don't want you to think you're always calling to <laughs> <laughs> join, right? <laughs> well, uh, luck, luckily, I'm from Throckmorton, so you know, man, <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of philanthropic uh, responsibilities there. What's the most meaningful way you've ever been thanked, Ross? Well, the most meaningful way is one of the ways they don't even know they thank you. It's like the lady, the nurse that showed me around the cancer's treatment center. I wondered if you'd say that. I mean, that was the most meaningful way that I've ever been thanked. Which I think uh, speaks to that there is activity happening behind the scenes, that there's a culture of appreciating philanthropy, you know, which does happen, and there's a there's a way to roll that out internally and in how you talk about it so that those things happen too, you know? So I think there is a call to action for us, even in the, what seem unplanned. I mean, if, if your staff know and understand what transformational philanthropy looks like, those moments are going to happen more often. So Yeah. And you know, the, the, there are great at, at times that there have been uh, uh, the OSU foundation, uh, Kirk and Melinda, uh, Mary Fisher, both gave a very meaningful gift to me, uh, uh, you know, uh, which, which was a branding item of OSU with a, a, a map that tracked what I had contributed to OSU in, in various positions up until about 01 or 02, and that was very meaningful. It's it's actually on my wall. And then uh, after the McNabb Center opened, they put a, a I'm sure Debbie will be <clears throat> very responsible for it, they put a book together that was photographs from that night and, and of, of everything that, that they did. But those were two great gifts that were meant to be mementos, and they were great gifts. But the most momentous gifts that we received were the Cancer Center uh, lady there. And then I'm going to tell you that the second most. If any of you were lucky enough to go to the uh, one of the three concerts that the New York Philharmonic played, they, they, they played the alma mater at the end of it. And we didn't know they were going to do that. They had had it orchestrated by Jeff Tysick, a, a friend of ours who was conductor of the uh, Buffalo Symphony. And he had orchestrated the, the school song, the alma mater. And we didn't know they were going to play. And when they did, and, and when they, uh, uh, everyone stood and sang, and swayed inside that auditorium. It was, there wasn't, there literally wasn't a dry eye in the place. I was sitting with the president of the New York Philharmonic, Deborah Borda, the chairman of the board, Oscar Tang, and, and his wife. And they said, what is this? And they had no idea because they were all graduates of Harvard where they don't have they the great education process, but they don't have that feeling towards their university that a place like Oklahoma State did. And the and, and experience of that, the love of the university and it. We went outside after and the ushers were just great. They were students that may not have been there but a year or two years, and they were ushers. And they were great. So that was a great thank you that the Philharmonic paid to us that, and had orchestrated for us. I have to add another question onto this because I heard about that story from at least 10 different people <laughs> and what it meant to them personally. So I know that story is definitely true because it resonated. I want to know what the philharmonic conductor head of the philharmonic said when you said i want to take your entire crew out to stillwater oklahoma <laughs> population 50,000 <laughs> it was a, it was a long time in coming convincing that, <laughs> 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 that, this, that this was that this was a really good idea because they had no idea what to to expect okay and and uh, it was funny at, at the dinner after afterwards uh, at, uh, at the gala uh, afterwards, uh, I, Jan von Sweden, who is the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, came up to me and he put his arm around me sitting at my table. And 
dinner was over and people were dispersing. And he said, uh, I know you told me you didn't want me to play the same song. Because I have the same performance, which they normally do if you've been to New York to the Philharmonic. They'll play the same thing Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoon. Saturday evening, okay. And it's the same performance. And that way they, they get it right. Because you know, they have different. But I knew we'd have a lot of repeats. And I said, I don't want the same performance. I don't want any song being the same, except maybe the National Anthem. Because I'd like for you to open each, uh, each of the concert with a national anthem, because it's so moving. But it's done by that magnificent orchestra. And then he comes up and he puts his arm around me, and, and with his uh, Dutch accent, he wants to know, is it okay if I play? And he called it the hymn. Oh. And he said, is it okay if I play the OSU hymn? Oh. And the other two performances. Oh, said, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It's okay if you play. <laughs> Can we the rename hymn, it yeah. the OSU hymn also? Yeah. I was just <laughs> thinking, like, Ross needs to give a speech at, oh. at uh, graduation, and that is what it should be entitled. He's wow. been the keynote. I know. Yeah, I mean. several times. <laughs> I have a question for you, Ross. <laughs> I'm betting sure, it. Sure, Jim. So I am of the upcoming generation of fundraisers, philanthropists. I want to hear any big dreams that you may have for the philanthropy world or something you may say to kind of the next generation as we as we kind of take take charge? I think your gifts have to be in things where people need help. Okay, they need, the way we can make people better, the way we can make the world better is through two things. Just two things. It's not, I'm sorry, it's not athletics. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, it's not. But it's primarily education and health care. If we can get people educated, and, and that doesn't mean they all need a bachelor's degree in business administration. Education be, can be teaching them, if they're good with their hands, to be a, a, a great plumber because they can make a wonderful living. But we've got to make it where they don't quit school and, and flip burgers at Burger King or work at 7-Eleven. So we've got to go through a proper education process. The ones that want to go to college, there should be an easy path for them to do it. Okay, the ones that want to go into vocational school, there should be an easy path for them to do it. And it should go immediately into some type of apprenticeship, into some type of, I know in, in all these small towns that, that I'm involved in, that they all have a plumber, they all have an HVAC person, and they're all getting, like me, pretty long of tooth. And for you kids, that means you're getting old. And, and, and <laughs> so, but, but, and, and so they don't have anybody to sell it to. They don't have anybody to take it over. And, there's, and, but if they had someone that had been apprenticed, they could do that. And so think about those things. And then healthcare is just, uh, uh, you know, you can't do anything if you don't feel good. And we owe it to every American citizen and, and to everyone that, all of our weakest links that all of the people that need the safety net that we can give them in America, we can give them through health care and, and through education. And that's, that's where, in my mind, it needs to be. Once you get them educated and, and once, they're, uh, once they're healthy, then we can train them in the arts. Okay. Yay, and, and, but if that. they don't feel good, they can't do that, and it, and if they don't, if they can't make a living, they can't do that. So, um, I sound like an old liberal, but <laughs> but, uh, I, but but I mean, as you get older, you realize how important these things are and these opportunities are. Where would I have been if I hadn't have been able to to go to Oklahoma State University mm -hmm. and and do the things that gave me the confidence to do? And and again, I'm going say that, that probably probably the same thing happened at, at OU or, or Texas Tech or Texas a and or the University of Texas. But uh, because they're all great in, institutions. And so take those opportunities to affect people's lives. And there's no place right now that people's lives can be affected better than through education and health care. Amen. And 
I, I think the thing that just resonates with me so much in the story as, as we listen to Ross is that if you go back to the beginning and Ross talking about losing his father so early on and about how this community came around and encircled him and lifted him up and allowed him to reach his full potential. And it's like the metaphor to me, at least for Ross, is that Ross just continues to find people who are vulnerable in the world and he takes his philanthropy and encircles them and lifts them up in the same way. And I just think that that is something that anyone can do in this lifetime. You don't have to be someone of extraordinary means to be able to lift somebody up and to look for someone who's vulnerable in your space in the world. I think we can all, if you're someone who's working in a nonprofit right now, where are your Glindas in your nonprofit? <laughs> where are they? You know, who has been quietly soldiering, carrying that mission forward, who may need just a little bit of a platform to come out and be the face of your mission. I can guarantee you Scott and White never once thought that Glinda would be the face of their cancer center before you made that phone call, Ross. But to me, it just underscores the power of one person's kindness, their compassion, their humanity, and how that, I mean, that effervescently sort of spilled out of her and was larger than life for Ross to see and I just think that anybody can do that. You don't have to be a Ross McKnight, you know, to be able to do that in this world. And that is such a great challenge. And I thank you for, I don't, I, I don't think I could have seen that before this interview, but that is what I'm taking away from this, Ross. Um, and you look like you're about to say something, so I'll let you. Yeah, it goes back to what I, something that I did start to say when I got, when we were discussing Linda. And I think it's the most important thing that, that I could say about this is somebody wants to congratulate you on being successful. Don't ever. Success is not important because success in my mind is defined as what you do for yourself. Instead be like Glenda. She told me I'm not successful enough to have my name on that. And I said, Glenda, you're significant enough. And significance is what you do for others. Remember, success is what you do for yourself. Significance is what you do for others. And we all, no matter what our walk in life, can be significant.